We have a choice before us on this day, my friends. Will we let this week go by as any other week, or will we engage? There is a great density of grace in the air. On every page of the liturgy, of the scriptures that accompany us, and of all that will be said in prayer by the whole mystical body, will we just engage with the worker day as though nothing were happening? It is the test of our friendship, our authenticity of relationship. Do we care? Do we feel? Years ago, in formation, I was given to read something from the internal experience of, it was then the Carthusian Order, and it was this event that happened years ago. It was a grumpy novice. He observed, but not willingly. And one day, he was shown something which made his hair stand on end. The Lord appeared to him carrying the heavy cross and indicated to him that it was heavier because he wasn't being helped. He got the message and never complained again. Some souls are called primarily to suffer victim souls. We try to avoid suffering and wriggle out of it by fair means or foul. We do not engage with the passion. And yet, all, I say all, the saints have known its importance. It's the one common denominator. All the saints loved the cross and even sought it. In the Gospel, we see at the moment of expiring that the whole cosmos, as it were, starts to respond. There is no more light. The sun, as it were, is sad, as the light of light himself is eclipsed. There is an earthquake, which, by the way, one can still see the trace of there under the Calvary mountain, left open for the eye to see, protected only by a glass, where the earth split. One can also see the precious blood in the rock, again under glass. Tombs started to open. And these souls of the just moved around and were seen. Very strange. We also know that things started to go wrong in the temple. That veil which separated them from us, as it were, was broken in two, top to bottom. The Holy of Holies was then laid bare. The great film of Mel Gibson actually portrays it very well, showing how at the moment of expiring and saying those cosmic words, it is accomplished. The whole of the preparation was over, and there's a scene in which he portrays very well the high priest seeing with his own eyes the old order of things crumbling before him. As we know, Mel Gibson based his work on good research and also on the visions of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. And she was shown very clearly how they were trying to keep it going, <coughs> keep the structure going, and yet everything was out of sync. Something was hugely, hugely wrong in the temple from that time onwards. 
And grace was being deflected by the chosen people. Not all, but massively. They're still waiting for the Messiah. It can happen to us as well. Push away the grace that's actually coming. In the first instance, the cross as it comes, without selecting or inventing another one and refusing that one in the first place. And then, coming back to that little vision that the novice had, the actual wanting to be with Jesus as the one who bears half the weight. Now, I want to zoom in briefly into bearing the weight in this week. He will be aggressed, attacked, taken by the sword. Very, very few will come to Easter Day washed in the blood of Christ, but very, very many will approach the body of Christ and hurt the Lamb of God. These last days, especially the Triduum itself, are days when there's a huge amount of grace suspended in the air. Do you know that the experience of the Church is that Holy Thursday night is the night when traditionally and still many, for some reason, feel and hear the call to serve the Lord at the altar. It's a privileged time, not like the days that follow, it's interiorised, watching until midnight. No noise or distraction to assail us or take us away from him. Interiorised availability. And that's what has gone for many of our celebrations. We perform and we can't engage. Actually, only yesterday it hit me how in good situations one is taken by surprise, and it's everywhere now, I know. Two things hit me. One was talking to a person who had come on retreat and was saying what that person had seen in church. Not the only thing that she would see, because lots of good things do happen in Italy, but this one had upset her. The priest, a young priest, had gone to the altar with a device in his ears and on his mouth, and a tablet in his hand, and was fiddling around, getting automated music and whatnot to accompany the liturgical celebration at the altar. And then, I was celebrating quietly yesterday, as I would do every month in a nursing home, and what happened? Very good celebration, actually, they've got the faith in those places, and one young nurse actually went on her knees and received what went on her tongue. I thought, wow, fair play for the lassie. But then another nurse, a good lady, but just put on this pumped automatic music and song. Okay, goodwill, but it's a great nuisance when actually the Lord wants that time for himself. He's pushed out by noise. We need interiorized liturgy. This, therefore, is what I leave with you on this week interiority and accompaniment. It's linked with one key. Don't forget it, in Holy Week especially. The whole attitude of interiority is linked with one secret. The way that the body behaves. Silence in our walk. Silence in our eyes. Silence in our ears, silence in the voice. We don't have to shout to get our message across. Silence in all the external being, so as to dispose the soul to handle its God. Actually, I was touched only yesterday when somebody at the Hermitage Mars muttered quietly afterwards, it was interior. For these first efforts, the soul merits, that is, wins, according to its own capacity, to perceive the voice of the Lord. How well rewarded is this first step? It
calls the soul into the desert. It flees all that could distract it, beginning by, yes, just one button on the computer which absorbs soul, mind and time and takes away Jesus from the midst for hours. Because, and this is the very thing, in this second state, the desert, it flees all that could distract it. It distances itself from noise. It flees alone towards him who is alone. The old Carthusian saying, never less alone than when alone with the alone. In him, it tastes the foretaste of divine union and feels something of the jealousy of its God. Our God is a jealous God. He wants all of us. And it is silence, the silence of recollection, or, if you like, recollection in silence.